presentation, not, not the presentation, of their importance in the medal. Above this, there's a national defense ribbon. And it has, like some of these other colors, you, you may notice that some of these colors kind of fit like there's red, white, uh, green and white and red and green and white and yellow and whatever. But this is the silver star and on the back it says for gallantry in action, heroism. And I didn't think I was being heroic at all. I will, all I was doing was <coughs> telling my men who were stopped by several pillboxes, concrete, <coughs> three foot wide combat positions. And when I got up there, my troops were slowing down. The longer they stayed in one place, the more likely they were to be killed off. So I told them, you go do this, and you go do that, and you go do something else. And they all scattered out. And instantaneously, is what the pillboxes were supposed to do is cover each other's front. Well, if this one over here is being attacked, he's going to turn his defense this way, going to leave a gap. So that's what happened. It's simple army leadership. So this is the for heroism. It is show just. It. I think you want to show yeah. it. Yeah, Lisa, I want you to hold it. It's just under the. Let me zoom in on it. There we go. Okay. The highest medal is a Congressional Medal of Honor, and more than half the time it is awarded awarded posthumously. There's nobody there to receive the medal. The body, maybe the casket or her family get it. There's the next one is the National Defense Medal, which is the next above the Silver Star. There are few officers who wear it. I was recommended for it just as the war ended, I and mean, before the war ended, I was on board ship coming back across the ocean. And at that time, I was given orders to come back home and return to the unit within 30 days. The war wasn't over. I expected to go home and go back. I complained to everybody, and my regimental commander, Colonel Haggerty, said that uh, you're the last of 20-some captains that I brought over. The only living one that's left, and here, there are some others that got emergency leaves or all sorts of So he said, you're going. I said, yes, sir. So I, on the way home, then I stopped off for my for personnel records. And Donald Allard said, and he was in the same OCS class back in 1942 at Fort Benning. Now his name must be off of the list. And he must be in that same book of pictures that I was in and somebody stole him. <laughs> so anyway, he said, Charlie, I put in that award for you. We got word a few days ago to pull all of these recommendations from people who were going home. They, the war wasn't over. They still didn't want to overload anyone on any level of, of metal. So I said, give me a copy. No, he said, I, he said, I was directly ordered not to give anybody a copy of any of these things that were pulled. He said, I'm only telling you that it happened because I'm, we've been friends for so long. So a good friend, but he didn't, wasn't quite good enough. Next to the Silver Star is the Bronze Star. Now this bronze star hmm. well, here it tells you on here two things. Can you read what that says Claire? Very fine print awarded for merit or heroism. Mm -hmm. Meritor
is the pictures that were sent, were given to me at a reunion by the son of my regimental commander who's standing there making the awards. Okay, got it.
the matter of metal oak leaves mean a second or more than the second award each time you get an oak leaf cluster. This one is the same general idea, it says for military merit. But at one time when I was stationed in Maryland, I was designated the liaison officer between 2nd Army headquarters and the Navy headquarters in Annapolis. And I went to meetings at different places down at Fort Monroe. Uh, went all the way on a joint services basis. One of the things we did was prepare plans for attacking Cuba. It was top secret at the time. It had to say what combat troops would be needed, what would it take to supply them. I was not in a command job here. There was several years later when I was in a staff job, an assistant directly or indirectly to the commander. So I was the Second Army commander's logistics or supply, ma uh, maintenance, that sort of thing, the backup. Uh, and I was awarded this one, which is the Meritorious Service Department of Defense level. Some people go to uh, the Pentagon and send one, spend one or two tours there and walk away without even this much. But I didn't even get to the Pentagon, but I got this kind of a medal. This one's beautiful. The colors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, this was a medal whose history goes back Revolutionary War time, and President Washington at that time wanted to do some kind of a recognition to outstanding soldiers. In those days, anyone who stayed alive was an outstanding soldier, then steel chickens or whatever. Well, this is the Purple Heart. I have a couple of marks on my body. This was burned from a, 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 one of these. Uh, sparklers that you bend and spin around and land it on and I can still see and hear and feel the feeling when I pull that red hot burning wire off of my arm. I've got a uh, cut so I got a piece of shrapnel and my left leg and left knee didn't touch the bone, touched only the flesh. The doctor says, you're not being evacuated. That's not the million dollar wound. You're going back in the line. You're not going the other way. But uh, I had, uh, what was the other, I had a couple of the scars, one was on my knee. You had a knife. This, was, a this, knife. this was shooting a gunpowder out of a rifle shell in the vice in the cellar of our house. So I had scars on me that are not from combat. And something with a knife, didn't you have a knife cut or something? In knife? The army? In the army.
that this is my results. <laughs> I stand here in front of Reggio Metal, I'm yeah, buttoning my shirt to show him where I was hit. That was a wound, but it was not a wound, a combat wound. That was a up, up here mental, mental wound with my regimental commander. Then he told me after due investigation, closing the whole range, infiltration range, firing and refiring machine guns, examining the posts that held the barbed wire up. He said, I believe you. And I said to myself, that son of a gun. He, I liked him very much. He was a great commander. He told me what he wanted and left me alone. And I said, he finally understands. I still can't really trust him completely if he didn't believe me the first time. <laughs> anyway. He's in that picture where the two uh, pictures were. He pinned the Bronze Star just behind the battlefield. Now, this, this couple here was, oh, that's the one I want, that's a surprise. This one comes, oh, that comes over here. Okay, then there are service medals, and there are lots of those. I'll show you. This is the medals before I made the last changes. I now have a, what did I say, 14, 14, no, 4, 3, 6, 9, 10. I've changed them around. I'll, I'll show you. I have there in there. This is a star, and that's why this is over here first. This was the European theater. Really, African, Mediterranean, and European theater. That uh, shows that these are awards for outstanding, meritorious, heroism, that sort of stuff. And down here you come, I was in the Army in the American Theater, American Defense, it says on there. I didn't realize there was all that much on there. For service during the limited emergency proclamation proclaimed by the President on September 8th, 1939, or, and then there's a word I can't read very well, the unlimited emergency proclaimed by the President on May 27th, 1941. And that's when they changed, instead of drafting it for one year, they extended it to 18 months, then just before Christmas, Pearl Harbor, it was extended for Duration of the war, however, and here's a young guy, for however long it's going to last, plus six months more. And that's when I told my my company commander, I'll, yes sir, I'll go to all OCS at Fort Benning. Well that, you may want to look at that. And This simply says United States of America, 1941-45. This is the American, uh, not the American, the European theater, like I said a moment ago. African, uh, Mediterranean, and European. Now, when we went over, we were only on the mainland of Europe. We didn't get over to uh, Italy or any of those other places at that time. But we had four what they call combat zones. And that's why there are four ribbons, the four uh, stars on this one. That means I've been in four different combat zones. World War II, four different combat zones. Is that that, that one? That's that yes. Area? This is this? Okay. Yeah. I don't want to see that one. Wow. I'm just a little hazy on these because. United States of America, 1941 to 45. Freedom from fear and want. Freedom of speech and religion. This was the Vic Victory Medal, and that is a quotation so often made for Franklin Roosevelt. We have nothing to fear but fear itself, and we must ensure for every person in America all of these things. Freedom from fear, freedom from what, so forth. All right. This is one they pull a little bit. 
defense medal. This comes up. This comes after the U.S. theater and before. Okay. This was just a service ribbon that I was in the service at the time. It doesn't say what time, but it was between service in the States and the combat service in Europe. And this was so-called victory medal. That's when we won the war over there. And this one is another one, and this has a little bit of a history to it that tells you what it's all about. I don't like to do this because when I sometimes when I try to put things together, I wind up sticking myself in the finger. This is the Army of Occupation. After the war, some of our troops stayed over in Europe. The troops that I was with went off to Czechoslovakia as occupation troops and the areas were assigned on a military basis they had at the higher levels they had trained military government people who were trained in how to run cities water systems and everything engineers were in that group but this was the occupation army and because I was there and left the area before the war was over I get credit for an occupation medal uh, anyway, that's, that one, almost nothing. This one, where do you suppose that one came from, Claire? You can look at it and see what it tells you right on there, something that you... Like the good conduct? No. shaky.
firm work around that the reek. Now as a company commander I was qualified, usually expert, sometimes uh, qualified as a sharpshooter, but qualified in every one of the weapons. So I should be able to teach everybody how to do any of the weapons that we had in the company. How to fire a mortar, how to fire machine guns, how to fire Browning automatic rifles, uh, caliber 45. And I hope it's a long while before I put this uniform on again. While I'm putting this back, Claire, would you tell them about our friend in the yeah. back? Well, the same <laughs> friend that we went to visit um, that had the display of all the medals mm -hmm. told us that each time he gained weight or lost weight or whatever, he'd have a new uniform made because he wants to be buried in his army uniform. So I said to him, well, why do you have to keep getting new uniforms? Because they're quite expensive. I said, when you when you die, they can just cut the jacket down the back and, and fit it, you know. You don't have to buy a new jacket every time. Well, he never thought about that, but I guess he didn't like the idea of the jacket being slit, so he kept buying If I ever put that uniform on, I don't want him to have to slit it down the back. But I'll look pretty good in it, even, <laughs> if they have to. <laughs> They could probably just split it around the middle so that, you know, in the, in the back, you know, and so it would go around in the middle. That's about all. Although, actually, if he, if he tucks it in, why, uh, it will fit. If I die, I expect it. My lungs will collapse. My stomach will evacuate. And I'll fit in it. I can button it right now. That's what I say. I think... <laughs> Probably. All the air out. Don't inhale. I can do it. <laughs> now this is one that I am also very proud of. It is called Efficiency, Honor, and Fidelity. And on the back it says for good conduct. Imagine. Imagine if you think anybody in the Army today deserves a good conduct medal <laughs> when they're raping each other and stealing money and everything else. But I was never awarded this because before I put in three years as an enlisted man, as a corporal, if I had stayed three years, I probably would have been a, a buck sergeant, possibly, uh, certainly a tech sergeant, possibly a, sta a staff sergeant, tech sergeant. I could have gone up, but I shortcut and went in to become a second lieutenant. So this is a good conduct medal, which I did not ever get because I was not in the service long enough to be eligible. And Colleen and Michael found that somewhere at a yard sale or something and bought it and presented it to me for good conduct. And I've always been a good boy, Claire, you know that. Always. All right, I'll try to just get these out of the way and not restack them very well. I gave classes in, in uh, Henderson School for a kid, and they were like 6th, 7th graders. And, but I told them the story from a personal viewpoint about here's a kid who jerked out of society and thrown in with a bunch of people from all over the world, practically, all over the United States, and including some first-generation Italians and so forth. But, uh, There we Charlie. are. Charlie, University of Maryland. This is, look at the flimsy way that it is. This is the yeah, Vietnam. The Vietnam one there. I was awarded that by the unit that I was an advisor to. These are all bits and pieces of single medals, whatnot. Vietnam. Anyway, with that dress blue uniform, when you go to social occasions, then you can wear the miniatures. Instead of having just 
the ribbon, yeah, the ribbon and the medal. See, they're both here. The silver star, bronze star, army commendation medal with cluster, purple heart. I think this is American theater. I can't. Yeah, American something. You read American something right there. American theater. That's the American theater. Anyway, this and these, of course, then make one relatively small display of humanity. Mm -hmm. And just a personal Instead of this.
the uh, information straight. There. Man. This was some uh, taxonomy or group of uh, basic principles in the thinking process using knowledge, comprehension. It's not enough just to I know something to un comprehend it. Application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. I gave that kind of information to my more advanced kids. But we didn't spend much time on any of the war. We didn't do how many casualties and all that stuff. Sources of knowledge are intuition, authority, tradition, common sense, and science, etc. I didn't know I had all this stuff in here. This had to do with the classes I gave some other people. Class maybe with the teachers there. Uh, it goes over the depression, the dictators, and appeasing them. Uh, when Chamberlain came home and said we've avoided the world war, France was occupied. That's a little other set. You think I could borrow an envelope there from somewhere? I think we can. I think we, we can afford one. one. I think we can um, afford one, Charlie. This is a little diagram about the Saar River, the Moselle River, and the Rhine River, and. That was to remind me a little note. I wrote a monograph, a single person report on the crossing of the Saar River, which Claire has seen since then, magazine articles and so forth. Thank you. That uh, that opened uh, breaking through the pillbox lines. Well, the Rhine River runs down this way, and off from that comes the Moselle River, and over here goes the Saar River. The original defense line built by Adolf Hitler, pillboxes and everything else, he should have known better. A few years before that, the French had built the Maginot Line, all of these underground installations. And what do you think old Hitler did? He went around the edge of the Maginot Line and invaded France. Dic dictators are dumb as well as Democrats, I guess. <laughs> but when we broke through here, it was where it was a critical part of breaking this area, which then gave us a chance to put more troops against the Rhine River. And as we came to the Rhine River, or the Moselle River, and toward the Rhine, they kept backing up. And as we attacked, they pull away. They pull away. So uh, that's dangerous, too. You never know what you're going to see around the corner. Part of the clutch. You know what a clutch is? I've forgotten. A little round thing that you put on top of your metal. A little round thing you put on top of your metal. Look. Or any of these metals. Well, these are pin metal. Not the metals, the ribbons. Yeah, there's one right there, I think. See the clutch that goes on there? That's no, this yeah. size of whatever metal it is this size you could wear on your civilian clothes. And when I was stationed at Fort Meade every now and then, I would see some of the civilian employees, and there were several hundred of them when I was stationed there. There were at least five or six who worked in my little section, which was top secret control. And I knew so much stuff, I'd hope oh God, I hope I never pass out on the street. And they start asking me questions. <laughs> what are you doing in Cuba? Or that sort of stuff. Now, in the Army, when they send you a letter of appreciation or a letter of commendation, it comes out as his third endorsement. So anyway, it comes out from the first person who writes up the recommendation. Here's the basic letter, Congress of the United States, to General Upham, Commanding General of Second Army. I want to take this opportunity to thank your command generally and one of your officers particularly for the fine spirit of cooperation exhibited last week when I appealed to the Army for help in connection with the devastating floods experienced in the Ohio, the Upper Ohio Valley. In response to my appeal for help, Lieutenant Colonel Eastlake, out of his way. 
less than three days' time. So whatever other plans you have that are hinging on this plan, what are you going to do? And that's where they stay. Actions and orders. You're given a problem, what are the actions and orders? It seems like all my life, my mother, my father, the people that I grew up with, teachers, army officers, all said, all right, gentlemen, you got to do this. What are your actions in order? How are you going to do it? Uh, hell, I don't know right now, sir, but I will in a few minutes. Another letter of commendation. More planning. Oh, this is for Michael. I'll give him some idea of what uh, we've been talking about. Sir, he says, if 
you tell anybody I told you this, it's been a long time. I don't think you'll ever find that guy, and neither will I. <laughs> so I can get away with it. You tell anybody I've said this. You said, we have all of these records, every one of them, yours included, but they have been separated by certain categories. categories have to do with if you have any physical not disability but any physical that reported on your annual physical examination and I had one hearing aid reported in 63 he said then we have to be extremely careful where we assign people who have hearing aids people who wear glasses and here I was wearing glasses and one hearing they are put in a reserve category here. If they ever run out of spaces for those who are qualified, then they will dip into this. And, oh boy, I was ready to blow up that right I said, I can go, I can do any job that an infantry officer can do. He said, yes, but he said, my instructions are to separate them like this. I went back and told my boss, for a few minutes, I thought he was going to run right down and call the president up. At least he made me feel pretty good. But I never did get that promotion. Either. This is from the 47th Infantry, 47th Regiment. That's one of those. Uh, I'm born just before I got out of the Army. I was stationed at Fort Belvoir, for, uh, which is an engineer post. I was stationed there for retirement, processing of my papers, telling me how to write a, a uh, resume to look for a job and all of these things. I was there about three days, called up the, the post commander. I went in and was, met the post uh, deputy commander, chief of staff, and then he took me in to meet the general. And I was standing up stiff at attention. He said, uh, I will have you for two or three months. You're not assigned to any of my units, just in the holdover category. You need processing. And said, but I would not like to waste any uh, the talents that you may have. I want you, well, I see you've conducted a number of schools enlisted men's schools, uh, officer schools, special subjects, general subjects. You have completed the commander general staff. You're eminently qualified here in the training aspects. Yes, sir. After my combat service, I went right into training and then logistics. He said, I would like you to get one of our inspection forms and inspect my engineer officers who are conducting the engineer school. With all due respect, sir, may I ask what you think will be the reaction of your officers? I know they will accept me because you sent me there. But what do you think will be the effect on their morale if an infantry officer comes in and tries to tell a teacher at the engineer school, the top engineer school, God damn it, you know, oh, you're mad. Get out of here. Before I could salute and get out of here, you make every one of your appointments. Don't you do anything that you ought not to be doing while you're on my post. And keep keep close chaps with the with the personnel officer. Keep your appointments. Well, oh, he's rattling all this stuff. Uh, what he was telling me, don't you dare sneak over that line a little bit. Uh, yes, sir. Whew, oh my God. Anyway, that's the time when I made a doghouse for down on uh, Am. Uh, Antrim. Antrim Avenue. It's where I made uh, desks to fit in the two projecting windows on this two bedroom. Desk with drawers and file places. And all of these things I was doing at the, in the woodworking shop. Anyway, uh, th these are what you wear if you're wearing a com camouflage unit. If you don't have a reflecting type. If this were shined the way it ought to be, this would perhaps give away your position. This is my general's star. 
it means that with this I am on the general staff. I'm assigned in the group of personal group headquarters, range all the way from maybe captains up to full colonels that are on the general staff.
But in the Borda case, it wasn't this metal, combat metal, combat infantry. It was the Navy's equivalent, which he was wearing day after day. His initial reaction was that he was told that he was entitled to wear that particular award. Presumably, in the Army, they would have called it as orderly, whatever they call it in the Navy. He would have told them, get one of these and put them on my uniform. And he wore it, knowingly or unknowingly. And that makes me wonder if, in fact, he committed suicide over that. But there were some articles in military and non-military news media that said, and I could show you this evening right now, especially when my blue uniform in there has all of my up-to-date medals. I don't know whether Claire mentioned it, but if and when I die, I want to be buried in Arlington near my son Peter. And with that particular uniform, put it on, and anyone who's knowledgeable can say, oh, this guy was in World War II, he was in an infantry unit, he has accomplished certain things in training, like expert with a carbine, and all of these things that can allow that information. Now, that took me a lot longer than 20 minutes. An hour and 30 minutes is what you were allowed. Well, an hour and 10 minutes. All right, now what do you do with these pictures? Lisa was listening, so I continued to talk. They show up on your TV screen? Is that the way you...